Hey, this morning I want to continue our series, but as we jump into the series today, I want to ask you this question. What do we do when our lives suddenly change? Have you ever had one of those moments where your life suddenly changed? How do we let go of the past while trusting God with an unknown future? How do we let go of those things while trusting God with an unknown future? We build an altar. You see, I don't want to assume that everybody in this room understands what I mean when I say an altar or building an altar. In the Old Testament, because of sin, our relationship with God was tragically broken. And so God initiated a reconciliation plan, a way for us to be made right with God. And by doing this, he allowed something called animal sacrifice where uh, uh, individuals, humanity would take an animal and they would present it before the Lord as a temporary payment for their sin. Something had to die uh, as a result of their unfaithfulness, uh, uh, as a result of their sin. This was the only way a holy God could come uh, and, and come near or dwell among a people that was sinful. So consequently, individuals built physical structures that we call altars. Often they were made of stones or or various other natural elements. And on those altars, they would offer sacrifices to carry out their spiritual responsibilities. And even then, altars were considered sacred spaces because in a sense, they were places where heaven touched earth. And later, altars were also built as memorial monuments to mark and remember where God had showed up and how he had showed up on behalf of his people. Now, fast forward to today. Because of the cross, the work that happened in the New Testament, we are no longer required to offer animal sacrifices. Come on, somebody. Amen. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. God's one only son gave his life so that we didn't have to. And so because of that, today I encourage us to live an altered life by making altars. You see, we are called to offer spiritual sacrifices of praise and worship every single day. The Bible says in the New Testament, we are called to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. Last week in our altered message, as we kicked off our series, I talked about Abraham and I, I talked about at the very end as he brought Isaac, God doesn't, God, God recognizes there may be, he's not asking for, for the things that are in your hands. Sometimes we, we get that confused about God. God is asking for you. Living sacrifices, coming before him every single day. So we create space in our hearts and in our lives to talk with God, to worship God, to cry out to God, to rededicate ourselves and to remember what God has done for us at the altar. You see, my, my hope and my, my prayer is that throughout this series that I will jar you and I will spur you on to be reminded of the importance of an altar, not just in a service but in your everyday life. You see, church, lifelong altars create lifetime transformation. When you live in that state as a living sacrifice. So this week, as we continue our altar series with a message called Altars of Change, and we're gonna explore uh, the life of Noah as he navigates uh, uh, by faith in a post-world flood, in a post-flood world, rather, And like Noah, we are challenged to bring every loss and every victory before the God of heaven. And we are invited to surrender our lives and futures to him. So what do we know about Noah? I know I'm sitting in a room full of church people who you say, I know about Noah. I learned about Noah. Noah and that big old boat, right? That big old ark. Well, Noah's the next altar builder in our series I want to look at. And yeah, we are rewinding a bit behind prior to Abraham. But what do we know about Noah? We know that Noah walked with God when others walked away. 
That's the first thing that we can understand and we can grasp about Noah. We can, we can even relate to this as a, as a people who are in pursuit of a God who loves us. Noah walked with God when others walked away. Genesis chapter six, verses five through nine. He says this, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth and the human race I have created and with them the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Now, I don't know about you, but I wrestled with those verses. Multiple times, this version of NIV uses the word regret. Other versions use the word grieve. I wrestle with the thought that God would be grieved or regretful over this moment. But I want to I make sure that you get the right picture here because God was not regretful or grieving for making a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. He wasn't grieving because people were mistakes. That's not what he was saying. See, people are not mistakes. This moment reflects God's attitude towards sin and rebellion as a just God shifts from mercy and patience to judgment. See, God gave humanity the freedom to choose between right and wrong. And he was grieved in his heart to see just how far humanity had fallen from what he originally intended. It wasn't that far, many generations, maybe, maybe a close to 10 generations since Adam and Eve that this generation that we're reading over is happening. Did I mention that Noah wasn't a perfect man? You see, we're talking about Noah, but it says that all of humanity was bent on evil. We're talking about Noah, who's made of the same flesh and the same bone, the same capabilities, the same temptations, the same uh, opportunities to make a mistake and, and, and fail. But yet something was different. He walked with God when others walked away. So Noah wasn't a perfect man, but we, we're going to see in just a few moments that the first thing that Noah did after building that ark and landing on dry ground was he built an altar to God before he did anything else. You see, altars are reminders of God's mercy, not mistakes. See, I'm afraid that every time I give an altar call in this room, the one thing that will keep you in your seats, and that's the one thing that the enemy loves to use, is a reminder that when you walk down to that altar, everyone's going to see your mistakes. You're, you're publicly declaring there's a mistake. And what I don't want you to miss in this room is that altars are reminders of God's mercy. Yes, we bring our mistakes, we bring our sins, our, our failures, our shortcomings to God because we understand that it is worth that because of what he did for us. We come and we approach that altar because it's better on the altar consumed by God than it consuming us. We understand that as we approach that altar, that altar of God is a place that reminds me, it's not, it, is, it, is, it reminds me that God is merciful you see, church, God is looking for people who will walk with him regardless of what the world is doing. He is looking for people who will be faithful, just like Noah. Not perfect, faithful. Faithful in the ups and the downs. Faithful in the good days and on the bad days. Faithful when life is easy or whether it's hard. You see, faithfulness is a choice and a calling. Let me say that again. Faithfulness is a choice and a calling. And Noah set his life intentionally in that direction. So before we go deeper into Noah today, let's look at the rest of humanity. 
because he's not the only person in this story. See, the New Living Translation says this. It says, everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Can you imagine living in such a world where all of humanity was bent on evil? Maybe some of you are looking around thinking, I think we, we might can relate to that. I thank God in the same breath that there are people like Noah who are choosing to walk with God when others are walking away. Why? What, what is happening in this moment? In the same there, God is giving. He's being patient. He's giving every opportunity. This is the mercy of God at work in our world today that even though everything looks totally bent on evil, we kind of go, what are they thinking? Who are? It is, this is the same scenario of what was happening as it was in the days of Noah. And God is being patient. He's using people of faith like you and I to declare. He can't, listen, God needs more heralds than pastors to declare what's going on in our world and what's happening and what the need is for us to approach the altar of God and to surrender to him our, our hurts, our failures, our mistakes, and even our doubts. You see, these people, this humanity, were descendants of the first family, Adam and Eve who knew God and his ways personally. They were familiar with this moment of bringing an offering or a sacrifice to the Lord. Yet even if this relationship over time with their creator was lost, they had a living, breathing uh, witness in Noah. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5 refers to Noah as the preacher of righteousness. If you look at scripture, he's the actual, the first evangelist in scripture that we see. He's the first one declaring be, to, his, to his brothers and sisters, repent. This is the first one, the one that we see where he's declaring them, hey, there is the, God is going to judge our, our, our unrighteousness. God is going to bring judgment on us if you don't turn, if you don't repent, if you don't bring the sacrifice and make an altar before him. We see him being this preacher of righteousness. And what the story in, in Genesis seems to imply is that Noah communicated what was right directly and indirectly. What do I mean? He did it by using words and he did it by action. He built an ark. You see, most theologians believe that it took him decades to build that ark. For decades, they watched him build that ark, and they probably mocked him. They probably judged him. They probably laughed at him. And he would declare to them, God's going to send a flood. And he's going to eradicate evil. This is your opportunity. Recognize the powerful God that we serve, the same people who knew their creator nearly 10 generations before. But instead of using their lives for good, they chose evil one by one until in the entire human race had become corrupt. And while Noah's righteousness clearly moved the heart of God, we see that in scripture, he was also moved by the rest of humanity's wickedness. And so God, consistent in his nature, in his just nature, he declared that he would send a worldwide flood to punish wickedness and cleanse the earth of the unbroken line of evil. But not before. <laughs> Don't miss this. You say, how could a good God do such a thing? He would bring this judgment on sin once and for all. But not before warning the wicked. Warning who, those hearts that weren't responsive to him anymore. He wouldn't do this before he would warn them. See, a just God gives you warning. He lets you know, if you do this, there'll be this consequence. We live in that kind of society. If you break this law, there will be this consequence most of the time. But in God's justice system, the wages of sin is death. That's been all the way from the beginning. And so he gives warning, but not only warning, he always provides, listen to me, a way of escape. You see, altars not only represent God's justice and judgment. Yes, as I said at the beginning, something has to die there. Something must be sacrificed there. 
And better you sacrifice what you are suffering with than that sacrifice sacrificing you. Because when you don't surrender it, when you don't lay it down, you are making yourself your own judge and jury. See, altars not only represent God's justice and judgment, but also God's mercy, his way of escape. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 says, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. You know, if anyone ever asks you, what does real faith in God and complete surrender or complete obedience look like? All you need to tell them is, tell them is, is building a giant ark when there's no sign of rain. That's what real faith and obedience looks like. It's building a giant ark when there's never been a sign of rain that would ever cause a flood. You see... God was asking Noah and his family to take a radical step. And God's request was to give their lives to something much bigger than them, to something that had never been done, so it was all done in faith. Genesis chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, captures a moment that God downloads the instructions on how to build the ark. And we're going to look at a screenshot of it. It says, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof of an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door, everybody say a door. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. Has anybody ever seen the ark, uh, the re restructured, the, re the built ark in Kentucky? Has everyone ever meant that? It's massive. I've never been there. I've, I've seen pictures and watched videos of the walkthrough. It's amazing. I, I heard this, that God gave an amateur instructions on how to build a massive boat that had never been constructed in history of mankind at this point. And professionals built the Titanic. One floated, one sank. I think we can trust God, right? So he put a door on one side of the ark. So what does Noah do? He immediately responds to God's instructions and he gets to work on the ark, regardless of the fact that nothing like this had ever happened before. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, it says, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. I'm going to read that again. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. This verse is, is short, but it's significant. Because God calls modern day believers, just like you and I, and those watching online today, to build a life that will last. That will withstand the storms of life. A life that is built on him. He calls us to do that to simply follow him, to be obedient to him. In other words, only God's way will last. The world wants to do life on their own terms, but the ark and its one door is an example or illustration that there is only one way. You see, all life entered through one door of the ark. There is only one way to God. And one day, that one door, that door of heaven will shut. And we must learn to embrace the change found at an altar before we're forced to change. Let me remind you that Noah wasn't a perfect man. And let me remind you that Noah, the man who found favor with God, was familiar with building an altar. Why is this important? It's important because I believe that altars serve as reminders of God's loving patience. I believe that the ark was large enough for more than just eight people and a whole lot of animals. I want you to think about this. That ark was large enough for a lot more people. 
You see, God always makes a way of repentance and for forgiveness. During the days of Noah, it seems that God gave humanity 120, not days, years to change its evil ways. God said in Genesis 6, 3, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Don't tell me God is not a patient God. <laughs> I'll tell you, you haven't met Jimmy Lunsford. God is patient. God is kind. God is loving. God is forgiving. But unfortunately, the people didn't respond in those 120 years. They didn't care. They continued to live their lives the way they please. They ignored God, and the longer they persisted, the more unsound their reasoning became, and the harder, watch this, the harder it became for them to change. Fast forward into the New Testament as Jesus, God's son, is on the earth in the flesh, and he's standing on the mountainside, and he's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, and he refers to the days of Noah in his teaching when he describes what conditions will be like just prior to the Lord's return the second time. Matthew 24 says in verse 37, as it was in the days of Noah, this is Jesus, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. This sounds amazing. This, is, this sounds great. There's nothing wrong with those things. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be, Jesus says, at the coming of the Son of Man. He goes on to say, two will be working in the field. One will be taken, and one will be left. One will be grinding grain, and one will be taken, and one will be left. But what catches me is that verse 39 says this, they knew nothing until the flood came. Are you kidding me? They had 120 years. They had witnessed the building of this ark for decades. They had heard this, this preacher of righteousness, this evangelist communicating, repent. These people weren't clueless. They were callous. When we're trying to tell others about Jesus, what we got to understand is often they're not clueless. They can look around and they ask themselves the question, how could all this be? Was it really just a big bang and boom? How could this be? Often the hardest thing you have to get through is the callousness of the heart. And the only person who can do that is God. Were they caught off guard? Ah, that's what scripture seems, seems to indicate here. But listen to me, there will not be a grand announcement when Jesus returns like that again. Scripture says it will be like a thief in the night. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says this, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. People of Noah's day were caught unaware. Not because there was no warning, they were simply consumed with their own way, living their lives and pursuing, remember, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, pursuing pleasures above all else. And while pleasure can be a good thing, pleasures were never meant to be our primary pursuit. So in the case of the earth's inhabitants in Noah's time, their pursuits were perilous, and it cost them everything. So in Matthew 24, Jesus' warning says that our generation is no different. That the earth that we live on will face judgment today, just like Noah's day. We're not exempt. So I ask you today, what about you? What are you consumed by? What is the primary focus of your life? Are you so consumed by your plans that God's plans seem irrelevant? 
Are you so consumed with pursuing the good life that the life God has for you never occurred to you until now? You may be sitting in this room or you may be watching online, but God is speaking to you right this very moment. Is your life so flooded with the voices of the world that you've been unable to hear the voice of God calling or warning you? If so, today is your day to build an altar. Would you bow your heads with me real quick in this room? Right now, if you're watching online or you're sitting in this room, and you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, God has been speaking to you. He's been warning. He's been patient. And he is merciful. But there is being a way presented to you right now. A way that is the only way. If you're in this room right now or you're watching online, I encourage you in an act of obedience and, an, and in an act of faith. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord's your personal Savior, you've never given your heart to Him, or today you feel this pulling at your heart. You don't know what it is. That's the Holy Spirit. He's prompting you. He's using the Word of God to remind you that the things that you are living in, they will pass away. They will be consumed. But beyond that grave, beyond this life, if, you're, if, you, if tomorrow uh, arrives and you don't ri- arrive in tomorrow, that your hope will not be in tomorrow. It will be in God. And so whether you're here today or online, I pray right now that you will make this choice. If you're here and you say, Pastor Jimmy, pray for me. I'm not going to embarrass you. In fact, I, I'm not done with my message. I'm about to move on. I've got, I got to just want to close the message. But I feel prompted. I felt prompted as I was preparing you this moment to, to pause right here because I believe that God was going to speak to you whether you, you're here or whether you're online. And if you're online, you can just chat in the box. In fact, there might be, there's a way on there that you can go and communicate with us to say, hey, I made this decision so that we can follow up with you. There's a QR code that you can scan, that you can follow. But if you're here today, let's skip the QR code moment. Let's just say, God, God, I am ready and I am willing. I believe and I will follow you. If, that's, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, pray for me, I'm not going to embarrass you, I promise you. But this is your moment. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If that's you, I'm just going to pause and then I'm going to move on. Anyone at all? Anyone at all? Lord, I pray right now on God for every individual sitting in this room and those who are watching online. Lord, I pray, God, that you will help them to take that step of faith, to have that courage and boldness to step out and believe, God, to pursue you when everybody else in their life may be going in the opposite direction to walk towards you, Lord. Give them the strength. Give them the courage. Give them the boldness. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Church, building altars makes you more aware of the things of God. See, creating moments like this, they make you more aware of what God desires to do. It's at the altar that I gave my heart to Christ. It was at the altar that I was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was at the altar that I received a call from God to preach his word. It was was at an altar that God reconciled a broken man hurt by by, by a a, a life of pain, of loss and suffering through losing loved ones and friends and family members. God reconciled that hurt and that pain and God brought healing. It was at the altar where these things happened. You see, the good news is that there was a man and a family who were aware and willing to say yes to God. And God God did the impossible. He preserved, preserved the life and helped them rise above the very thing that destroyed the entire earth. The ark withstood the storm. And after 40 years and 40, uh, 40 days and 40 nights, the storm ended. And after nearly a year, the flood waters receded. Can you imagine floating on that ark and all with all those animals and the entirety of humanity, eight people on that ark? Floating for nearly a year, the waters receded and Noah was commanded to exit the ark. 
and inhabit the earth once more. Genesis chapter 8, verses 15, starting at verse 15, says this. Then God said to Noah, as he landed on that dry ground, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. So Noah came out, verse 18, together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives. Verse 20, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. I told you he did that first, didn't I? He wasn't a perfect man. He was flesh and bone just like everyone else. But he walked with God when everyone walked away. He demonstrated faithfulness every single day. It was a choice for him. It was a calling for him. He built an altar to the Lord and taking some of all the clean animals. These are the animals that they would, would have been eating to survive. But he uses some of the clean animals because that's what they were supposed to use. He sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of their human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done, never again by consuming the world with a flood. But I love this. Noah steps out of that altar, out of that ark. And the first move, his first move was toward God. The first move backed by his faith and obedience led to a moment that moved God to make a new covenant with a broken world. This moment is very significant for Noah and his family and for us today because the world had changed literally in every way for Noah. Think about it. The entire earth was consumed by water. All of humanity was gone except for eight of them. And here they are having to begin again, facing this dramatic change, thinking about what they had lost, wondering what was ahead. And his first act after exiting the ark was to build an altar. This is the first time in scripture that we actually see a constructed altar ever mentioned. Yes, we see offerings and sacrifices all the way back to Cain and Abel. But this was that first moment that we witnessed this constructing of an altar. And what it reminds me in this first act of Noah, this first move towards God, is it reminds me that altars provide a way to change or begin again. They provide a way for you to be reconciled before God, to say, God, this is not who I am created to be. I am not the man or the woman that, that, I, that you have called me to be. And it caused me to change or to begin again through the power and the work of Jesus Christ. See, Noah and his family started this major change with worship, thanksgiving, and aligning with the most important thing in his life. And it was more important for Noah, watch this, to have God in this new change to invite him, to, to get his approval, to seek him. It was more important for him to have God in this new change of life than it was to have the answer or the next step. Some of us in this room, it's more important for us to have the next step or the answer before we even move. That's not faith. That's control. See, to Noah, this altar wasn't just a stack of stones in a side order of a sacrificial animal. It was a reminder that God is faithful, that God is all powerful, that God is merciful, that God is just. It was a reminder that God was just, he rescued him. He kept to his word, that he kept his promise. It was a reminder that God blesses love and obedience. And it was a reminder, a constant reminder that God judges sin. So what do you do when your life is altered. What do you do when sudden change happens, is thrown at you? What do you do when you're being asked to let go of the past and while trusting a God in an unknown future? You build an altar or you return to an altar. We see that later in scriptures. Jacob and his family returns to an altar, reminding this place where God met me and I met God. You see, learning to properly deal with change is so important for every one of us in this room, especially for believers, because our reaction or response is often, watch this,
barometer for where our relationship is with our Heavenly Father. How we respond is often an indicator of where our relationship or our faith is with the Lord. You see, feelings of closeness produce feelings of safeness, regardless of the environment. Now, I grew up with two older sisters. Now, they were fierce. You know one of them. And they would stand up for me, but I didn't have the privilege of having an older brother. In fact, my oldest sister was eight years older than me, and we lost my middle sister at 14. So there were four years difference between my middle sister and I. So when I hit the middle school age, I didn't have that luxury of having that older brother, but I always had that father. And I know for some of you in this room, you don't have a great relationship with your father. So you maybe can insert whoever this might be in your life. But when I was a child, I always had more courage when my dad was close by. His presence naturally produced peace for me. I was more comfortable in an unpredictable situation when things were changing. Why? Because I just simply believed on every level that he could handle anything. I believe that as a child, I believe that he can handle anything and that he was committed to me no matter what. I didn't have any other thought or any other even belief. I knew that. You see, feelings of closeness produce feelings of safeness regardless of the environment. So it, it leads me to ask myself in times when I feel far from God or when I, when I feel absent from his presence, is it, could it be that what I really need or what we really need is not more resources? We don't need more time or more benefits or more paid time off or more, or, or, or more money in our bank account, more things in our yard. We don't need more of this or more of that. But what about a more, more of an awareness of God's presence so that whatever change comes our way, my closeness and my proximity to God is what gives me the peace I need. You see, church, altars of change, they say, I praise you, God, for what you brought me through. I know it still cost me something to be here, but I praise you, God, for what you brought me through. Altars of change say, I worship you for who you are right now. Altars of change say, I thank you, God, for ordering my future even when I don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. I thank you in advance. Would you stand with me all across this room? As I said in the beginning, my hope and my prayer is that you and I will grow more fond of altar moments because there's no doubt that every one of us in this room, our lives will be altered in some form or fashion. Some of your lives as young couples have been altered through loss of a child or even through loss of a mom or a dad. Some of you have been altered by losses of jobs and income. Some of you have been altered by children who have walked away from the faith and it hurts so deeply. Some of you, your lives have been altered uh, by even just this moment where you heard and understood that God loved you so much that he gave his one and only son to die for you on the cross. Our lives will forever be altered in every way and in any way, especially in a world that we live in that is full of evil. It's full of sin. It's a result of sin. But God has made a way. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We're going to just close in a, in a little bit of worship, and I want us to pray. Right now, you can make an altar at your seat. You can make an altar in this place. If you didn't respond for salvation, I'd love to meet you down here and pray with you. But I want to just, as we close and get ready for Pastor Scott to come and close our dismissal prayer, I just want us to just make room and say, God, Lord, whatever I need to do, I bring to you. And all that I am, I give to you, and I lay it down. And whatever that requires of me, whatever change comes, I lay it down. God, work on me. Because when we spend our life building altars, we will create lifelong transformation. 
Heavenly Father, I just pray right now, God, that we were reminded in this room, God, we will be, Lord, together forever. For those who know you, who call upon your name, Lord, they are saved. And Lord, we declare to you right now, God, that we love you, we praise you, we worship you. We declare, God, Lord, right now, with our words and with our actions, God, that we choose to be an altar builder. We choose to understand that as life brings it bring, is altered in every way, God, that we choose, God, to, Lord, not allow re the reality of this world, God, to alter our belief or our lives, but, Lord, to allow you, Father, the, the leading of your Holy Spirit, God, to change us from the inside out. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, God. Father, we want to thank you today for an incredible word, and we thank you for your presence that we feel in this room. And, Lord, we don't ever just want to talk about church we want to be the church, the hands and the feet of Jesus. God, we thank you for those who are taking time out of their schedule and, and, and out of their own budget, Lord, to go to Iceland. And God, we are asking you, Lord, that you would take their efforts like loaves and fishes and you would multiply it. Father, we believe. Lord, that as they go, they are going in the name of Jesus. We believe that they will have the protection of God. But Lord, we ask you, God, that you would speak to them. God, that you would go before them and prepare the way. God, that you would work out details that they can't even be aware of right now. And Lord, that you would make them a blessing to our missionaries, to the local churches that they will visit. And God, that they will encounter unbelievers who will ultimately come to know the one true living God. We thank thank you that the gospel is being preached. We thank you that there is power in the gospel. And Lord, we thank you that people will come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen.